Okay, hello everyone. This is uh, BJ Wilson, host of uh, Dinner and Movie tonight. Uh, we have a much larger crowd. Um, starting on my left, we have Steve, Juan, Joe, and Aaron, and Jordan, and Eve. And we're going to be discussing Quentin Tarantino's new one, Once Upon a Time in Hollywood, one of the worst movies I've ever seen in my entire <laughs> fucking life. I hated this movie, hated, hated, hated this movie so much. But enough about me. <laughs> um, let's go around the room, and, or around the table, and uh, just give first impressions I've given mine. Steve, would you like to start us out? Uh, Tarantino's still brilliant in my book. Juan, what do you have to say? Honestly, I hate to be, have a cop-out thing, but like I was telling my friends the other day, I think I've seen Hateful Eight 20 times now. I still don't know how I feel about it, and I don't know how I feel about this yet. I don't hate it, but I definitely don't love it either, though. Okay. So, right. Joe, what do, you, what do you think, Joe? Perfectly middle-of-the-road Tarantino. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so if this is middle-of-the-road Tarantino, what is the top and what's the bottom? Like at the top, like Pulp Fiction... Uh, Jackie Brown at the bottom probably in Glorious Bastards Kill Bill Volume 2 okay interesting perspective Aaron what's your uh, what's your first impressions of uh, Once Upon a Time in Hollywood as I said before uh, The Big Lebowski could have a diet version of it that was not as good that's what this movie would be Jordan Jordan what do you have to say yeah um, as far as like in the scheme of like Tarantino I think it's probably my second to least favorite one um, Second to least favorite. Okay, what's yeah. your least favorite Tarantino? Hateful Eight's my least favorite. Okay. Um, but although I think, like, cinematically, it was, like, really nice. Like, it had some really nice shots, some really good tracking shots like that. But, like, the story was just kind of really disconnected, I felt, mm -hmm. uh, as far as, like, kind of, like, the three different narratives that I, that I saw going on there. Okay. So definitely bottom of the barrel. Right. And, Eve, what do you think of uh, Once Upon a Time in Hollywood? Um, as far as overall entertainment value... I will say that the first half of the movie I was completely bored and said I will never see this again. And <laughs> by the time it ended, I, I couldn't wait to see it again. So really? I really liked mm -hmm. the ending. I thought it dragged. I kept looking, you know, there's been so much buildup to this movie and so much so much references to all the, the great directors that he is influenced by. I was just looking for those influences and I saw them. Um, also saw, saw a few errors right off the bat. Mm -hmm. um, and I won't go on and on, but I think that Jackie Brown is his best. Okay. And this might be his worst. Okay, but you still want to see it again. But I do want to see it again. Okay. Because it was a lot to absorb. Yeah. And there's always details that are enlightening that you miss in the first... I mean, I do. I can see yeah. I can see this as like a good movie that has like... You need to watch it at least twice to pick up on stuff you didn't see the first time. Yeah. The way that I perceived this movie was simply as a framework upon which Tarantino hung all the 60s slash 70s stuff that he values so strongly. The advertisements, the fashion, the cars, the music. It seemed like in every, in every scene, every scene at least started with like, you know, the, the shot of the carnation ice cream stand and then it would, you know, zoom out or track over to something else. Um, and it seemed to be very repetitive as far as that stuff was concerned and didn't really add much to the story. It's like, okay, so there's a carnation ice cream shop. How does that affect this relationship between Leonardo DiCaprio and Brad Pitt? I don't know that it really was. It was just kind of like, you know, wall art or, you know, something that... You know, Tarantino just wanted to remind you of because of this uh, this heyday. Steve, you said something interesting. You said uh, Tarantino is still brilliant. Uh, what was what was brilliant about this movie in your perspective? Uh, I thought the writing was really good and clever, but I just think just the filmmaking. I mean, I'm not a critic at all, and I haven't even. I'll go ahead and tell you that I haven't even seen all of his movies. Mm. I would put Pulp Fiction at the top. Um, I had no expectations. I didn't read any reviews. I didn't do my homework. I don't. I manage expectations by not having any. Uh, I just sat down and, and watched what I thought was just, just visually, just filmatically, cinematically. I just, thought, I just loved it because, and it, like, you know, I kind of lived it. You know, what I mean, I was four years old in 1969, and um, so I, there was a nostalgia for me, like, and not just a nostalgia for some area you didn't live through. Mm. Um, so it so he's probably he's probably making movies for people like me, you know what I mean? Um 
Um, what else did you ask me? I don't remember. <laughs> um, just just bouncing off of that though, like I was when I saw it, I was saying that like it's interesting to me that Tarantino seems to be like the last few movies has been his nostalgia tour. It's almost like he's just like doing this like old man thing, like not even in a negative way saying that, but it's just like let me revisit like everything that I love about the movies. I think it started mm-hmm. with Kill Bill. That was an obvious homage. To, you know, exactly like, you know, 60s, 70s, Kung Fu, Samurai movies and Kurosawa, all that stuff. And then he moves into, you know, Spaghetti Western, Django and Jane. And then he does Western Western, like with Hateful Eight. And then the World War Two. Right. And then like, exactly. And then I'm like, so what is this? That's what I was asking. Which he revisits like, you know, within like, this movie. Exa- right. Exactly. And I was like, so what? Exactly. So uh, that's the conclusion yeah. I came to, too. I was like, so it's like his you know, fascination with that time that he didn't live in. Like, I was saying, like, the scene in the Playboy Mansion, we all talked about that when we got back from it. It's like, what the hell was that there for? Like, what well, was like, 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 like an entire like unnecessary scene. Of this movie yeah, could the have closest I did, came, didn't need it. The it closest I came to, in, like, interpreting the Playboy Mansion <laughs> party scene was just to, like, draw a comparison between the life that Sharon Stone is living at the height of her stardom Tate. to... Sharon Tate. Tate. Yeah, Sharon oh, yeah. Tate. To Rick Dalton in like his waning stardom, like just kind of hanging out in his own like. Yeah, that was a, kind of a, like a music video too, and and he was saying, "Look at how much I'm nailing this period." There was there was definitely something. Yeah. Like that. Oh yeah. yeah. And then that Cass Elliot, the woman who was who was, I don't know if you guys even know. Mama, Mama Cass. Cass. Mama Cass. I yeah. mean, that looked just like her. It was like wow, and then it it panned up, and it was yeah. There wasn't a point to that, but I don't think there was meant to be a point to it really. <laughs> this video is going to be chock full of spoilers. If you don't want to be spoiled, don't watch it. The story, as it were is of a a cowboy western tv show star played by leonardo dicaprio and his relationship with his stunt double played by brad pitt this relationship uh kind of meanders on separate paths or the same path for a while and 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 it leads up to the uh brad pitt character discovering the manson family out at the spawn ranch uh, north of Hollywood, and their well, what's supposed to be the murder of Sharon Tate, but again, in in the tradition of Inglorious Bastards, where the characters get their revenge on Hitler, in this case, we see the characters not necessarily save Sharon Tate, but the murderers go to their house instead of the Tate house, Tate Polanski house, I should say, and are dispatched by Brad Pitt and Leonardo DiCaprio and Brad Pitt's dog. Um, More Brad Pitt's saving, dog than saving, Brad Pitt uh, than, Bra- yeah, than Leo. Dog. Leo's yeah. just kind of chilling in the back. I really want to adopt a dog now, I think. <laughs> <laughs> you mean watching think John Wick didn't okay. make you want to adopt a dog? <laughs> um, and dispatch is a very nice word. Right. You, yeah. Yeah. That's a nice word for brutally murdered. Yeah. Yeah, for real. That, those, those scenes with that dog were absolutely like... Um, yeah. They were pretty brutal. Uh, they yeah. were, yeah. yeah. They were pretty brutal. Um, and it was very funny. I mean, to, and that's always been his thing, is violent and hilarious at the same time. Yeah. I mean, that's always been his thing, except, where you're just like, uh, how am I laughing at something this violent? Yeah, except Django Unchained. Uh, Django Unchained, they, they, they certainly drew a, drew a line between the violence and the comedy. Um, the, the two guys fighting on the floor and the one guy who gets the dog sicked on him. I don't know, I think the last part of Django where uh, he's asking him if he ever got kneecapped and you yeah, have right. Samuel Jackson right. on the ground just yell it out of him like, you, right. this is uh, you mother. It seemed to me like the, the I'll call it the Sharon Tate sequence, even though it's not what it was, but the, the, the scene at the very end seemed to be very rushed. It's like the the percentage of the movie that that sequence takes up is very small compared to the rest of the movie. Did these storylines really match up as well as they could have or should have? Or should these have been two different movies altogether? Well, like I was saying in kind of the, the intro, I thought there was like three different narratives going on that didn't seem really well connected. So yeah, I mean, like it probably could have worked Almost better is like almost like kind of like a grindhouse type film, where you have like the one shot and like the one one storyline, and then like next movie other storyline. Yeah, um, and they all come together at the end. Right. 
I get the feeling that <clears throat> uh, Tarantino wanted to include that end scene just because that is the scene, like, that is the event that kind of defined, like, the end of the hippie era and, like, the end of the 60s to the start of the 70s. It's like, whenever you think about that time period, you think of, like, the Manson family murders. Hmm. As far yeah. as, like, that end sequence goes, like, for me, like, you're right. Like, they even bother to put, like, timestamps like on like every little part it was like okay here's a day and it was like this is 10 o'clock this is this this is that and then you're like all of a sudden you're like why though <laughs> because like if you're gonna do whatever the hell you want why why did you bother to the try sun, to like the sun has already set yeah like exactly <laughs> like I, did, I didn't understand that it's not like it's not like the the family the manson family people and sharon tate or even uh Brad Pitt and, and Leo were on some sort of collision course yeah. that you needed yeah. to sync up the times or anything like that. It just, yeah, it just seems kind of artless to me. In the language of film, you're supposed to show, not tell. So were those date subtitles really necessary? Or could we have just shown Sharon Tate very, very pregnant and made the connection ourselves? I think it just like added like more like a, a sense of urgency. Like, you know something even if you if you don't know what that that was the date that the Sharon Tate murders happened mm. you, like if you didn't know that it would still create the sense ideally that like there's a big event gonna ha- that's gonna happen because you're going by time by time like yeah. at 10 o'clock at 10 30 they're doing this as soon as you hear that sounds like very much like almost the rhythm and cadence you heard in so many yeah, it's like, a, like crime retelling right. dramas always like mm. she walked in at 10 30 it's like, okay wait what the heck's yeah. gonna happen yeah, to make what are we think, counting down to? to make you think it's gonna be historically yeah. accurate and then yeah. it ends up not being at yeah, all right. it, or it's like a bomb countdown like like in 24 when like <laughs> Well, oddly, the when he's getting questioned by the police or the ambulance or whatever, um, the, the police and the person, the questioner is, uh, repeats, "What now? What time was it?" And he says, "Well, it was midnight." He's like, "Exactly midnight." He's like, "Well, no, maybe five minutes after. I don't know." But I thought, well, "What is this about? <laughs> you know, is like, this some you... inside joke yeah. from you know the, the stage crew or something? I don't know." It, it there was a lot of just superfluous. What seems superfluous uh, and might come together on a third viewing. I don't know. Yeah. I'm kind of like, oh, I remember that when uh, I was being questioned by the police for murder. <laughs> <You're right. laughs> oh, they're asking questions. Is it exactly midnight or is it 12.05? No, I don't care. Yeah, that's what they do. That's <laughs> what they do. Yeah. But, um, I don't know. Okay, so do we want to talk about, like, the end specifically? Like, yeah, sure. You want yeah, to go yeah, there? Want. Okay, that was... Fucking awesome, man! Sex, <laughs> sexy Sadie did not end that night like oh nearly as God. well as she did in real life. Just, I just want to ask because we had a little debate yesterday: who got it the worst? Which one of the hippies got it the worst? Oh, mm. sexy Sadie. Sadie, yeah, yeah. Because yeah. uh, I said it was like Face Smash Girl. Like that's that's, that's that kind of up for debate. Choose which way to die. I would, I yeah, smash yeah. yeah. I would die the way of Pink <laughs> Patty. I would not want to die the way of Sexy Sadie. Right. Linda Kasabian was the one who really made it out because she fled the scene before it happened. I love that. I love that old thing. Just the like, uh, movie. Yeah, so it's like, you're going to need the keys. I got my knife and go, oh, yeah, thanks, man. I think it helps you to realize like, Linda Kasabian had only been part of the Manson family for about a month before mm. she was part of the Man- like a, the Sharon Tate murder. Huh. Whereas all the others had been part of like the Manson family. Especially uh, Sexy Sadie and Big Patty, since it formed like a 16, 18 months prior. Yeah. Someone here might know better than I would. If you're high on acid, can you fight as well as Brad Pitt fought in that sequence? I, know, that's, I, I think yes. that's how the Manson family fought, too, because when probably, cause during the Tate murders, like two out of the four were just ripped on either LSD and or Belladonna. Okay. It depends on the acid. Okay. Somebody threw was it a no was it who threw a no hitter on acid? Yeah. Oh, yeah. oh yeah. Uh, Carl, what? That's Carlton, uh, that's yeah. Not a thing. Dude. Oh, it is. Yeah. Yes, it is. Yes, yeah. it is. Yeah. There's a thirty for thirty guy, on this yeah, whole guy thing. Just, yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, some picture of some pro baseball team did a did a hit of acid 
and went out and threw a no hitter. We forgot that he had to like play that day or something. <laughs> yeah, yeah, like, like, I think yeah. he was on a bender and he was just yeah. like, "Fuck it!" Like, <laughs> well, yeah. and yeah, then, when you asked that question about Brad Pitt, I, that was the first thing I thought of. Yeah, it's like, like what, so, like, like, it was a no hitter with the pitcher on acid. <laughs> when I'm in the stadium, and and everyone trying to replicate it, immediately there's a week of baseball that was absolutely just fantastic. <laughs> <laughs> Getting back to the ending, I would say it was largely what I expected. Like, I expected something on the order of, like, Inglorious Bastards, where the historical events, they might, like, they don't, like, the characters are there, but it definitely doesn't happen according to history. Yeah. He's big it was on almost like a better alternative time. ending that was, right. that honored the dead, the actual dead. Well, it's like he, uh, one of the, one of the taglines of Inglorious Bastards was once upon a time. In fact, that's the opening, um, the opening shot mm-hmm. is the the title screen it says "Once Upon a Time in Nazi Occupied France." So, yeah, he's got this he's got this kick of uh, alternative history. Mm-hmm. That's Which, interesting that you bring that up because that was actually uh, I read just a few pieces on it, like the spoiler free stuff, and apparently there's some people who are really kind of pissed off, and they're like, "Why would you treat people's murders like?" Mm. This way, you're making light of like the people actually people died, died in, in like... the movie. Mm. So he kind of made it a Hollywood ending. I have no yeah. problem with any of that. Like, I don't think that I don't think Jewish people had any problem with the Inglorious Bastards, like <laughs> the way that ended either. But like, apparently, people are saying like, "Oh, that's so insensitive that like you would treat like the death of like real people. These that's really happened it, to these people. Probably, like, it's not funny. It's not a joke." But I was just like. I didn't get the outrage. Make historic yeah. documentaries if that's it probably right. doesn't help that there are still like people like associated to, like with Sharon Tate and also the Manson family members who carried out the murder still alive, including some of the murders. Yeah, mm-hmm. like I know Big Patty's still alive out Isn't there. Is Squeaky California. still alive too? Squeaky was did not take part in any of the murders. Didn't she try to kill? She, she, yeah, yeah. But that was after like Isn't everything Roman started Blitz going down. Yeah, he's yeah. he's still very much alive and. Yeah, and can never yeah. come to <laughs> doing a lot of uh, weird things. That's a whole other movie. <laughs> yeah, right. <laughs> um, if any of you guys want seconds, there's tons left. So please don't be shy. Oh, thank you. It was really good, though. Thank you. Okay, speaking of weird people and doing creepy things. Okay, so Once Upon a Time in Hollywood and Foot Fetishes. Oh, God, yeah. See, that was another thing that, that Tarantino <laughs> just wanted to hang on this framework of the movie. It's like... How many naked female feet can you cram into one movie? Most, most ever. This is his record. <laughs> now like, there's like you 25 minutes of movie that is literally he's not just feet back anymore. He, it's just it's, gratuitous now. It's yeah. like I, it, feel, it felt like Tarantino thought that was the only way how he could show how filthy the, the Manson family were. <laughs> yeah. Like the, otherwise, like, keeping the actresses Margot still Robbie in the movie the theater. Why'd she take her boots off yeah. and put her <laughs> feet on there? It was just God. literally like we were joking the other night. Like it was just like, all right, everybody leave the editing room. <laughs> it's like, I, I need to really focus in on this. It's like I can't edit when someone else is in the room. <laughs> Like, dude, you've been going over this one time. self for like problematic. Minutes. Hold on, I want to ask the the sole woman on this okay. entire. <laughs> I can't speak for all women, but I can speak for me. And the barefoot women does not bother me. Um, The only time I really noticed it was in the theater when she had her feet up. I thought, no, wait, she walked in with, you know, go-go boots. Why is Mm -hmm. she bare feet? Well, you know, if she had bare feet and go-go boots, it was probably sweaty and she needed to take them off. And that's exactly what I would do if I had... If I were her, I don't know. Really, so, you're yes. like, all oh, this is cool. I you think this totally, is totally normal? Totally cool. Oh, what about wrong. the scene with old girl leaning into the car with Brad Pitt? That was that that was unintentional. That was just a shot. Her feet? No, the ass. Oh. <laughs> yeah, that, 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 one, that, one, that one seemed to be there on for quite a while. Yeah. Oh, that, was like a, that was like a full minute. It was there a while. It didn't bother me. It didn't bother me, but I'm from another generation. I'm not okay. that sensitive. All right. I mean, I'm not sensitive either, but like... Come on now. It's just like, let's call a spade a spade, man. It's like, this man has drank tequila off his Selma Hayek's feet. It's just been, I mean, like, we can go on and on and on about, like, some of this stuff. And, like, I feel like we have to mention this. A man who's been associated with Harvey Weinstein, like, for his entire career. It's a foot fetish. It's a foot fetish. 
so typically, typically we've done this once. Um, what we like to do is close the show by giving the film that we've seen a letter grade. Um, last week we saw Jim Jarmusch's The Dead Don't Die. Last week, last month. Last, month. Uh, last time yeah, <laughs> we last saw uh, The Dead Don't Die. We gave it like a B minus C plus. Um, <clears throat> oh, also I have coffee brewing, decaf coffee brewing, if anyone wants decaf coffee. Um, this film, I, I'm going to be pretty harsh. I'm going to give this one a D minus. Uh, I just really thought it was amateurishly made sloppily written and just not up to Tarantino's usual uh, high standards. Um, Steve, I'm sure that you're going to go the opposite direction that I went. What grade not would quite. you I mean what grade would you give this one? Um, well, the more I think about it, I'd probably give it a lower grade, but I really enjoyed it in the moment. So I'd, I'd give it like a, a solid B or a okay. B plus. Okay. Yeah. Juan, what do you think? Come back to me. <laughs> okay. Really Joe, Joe what do you think? I'd say B minus B. Like, it's enjoyable, but, again, the more you think about it, the less it kind of makes sense. And, I don't know, like, I could see its rewatch value, like, last, like, a film, like, one more viewing, just to catch all the, back, like, the background details. But after that, I think it will fall off. Mm. Um, see? C? Yep, C. A solid C. A sol just, just, it's middle of the road. <laughs> Not that great for Tarantino, but yeah. Okay. Uh, Jordan, what do you think? Yeah, I mean, I'm going to give this one like a B minus, C plus, kind of teetering on that. Um, I think given like a second watch where you can kind of fill in a little bit more of the details, um, that grade could go either go up or down, just depending on how you feel about it. Because like there are a lot of like glaring like kind of shit moments in it. Uh, and again, it's like just way too fat. So it's like there's, again, easily 30 minutes of that movie that does not need to be on screen. Yeah. I um, so that's kind of, that's where I'm at right now. But. Okay. Eve, what do you think? What would you I'd give this one? I'd say you're right. A uh, D. A D? Okay. Yeah. All right. What improvements do you think he could have made to this one? Um, he, the, the story could have been tighter. Um, I could have cared more about the characters in general. They were comedic. The acting was good, but I didn't really care. I can think of half a dozen movies right now that aren't great that are better than that. Steve, you're the one. You're asking people about if they've seen The Big Lebowski Right. Whether they and liked it the first whether time. Whether they liked it the first time. I did not like it the first time, and I understand why you're asking. Um, I don't think that this movie has the same rewatchability potential because I don't think... I don't think the, anything does. Do, really? No. See, Big Lebowski? I'm, it just I'm, gets better and better every time you watch it, I think. Oh, yeah, I agree with that. Mm -hmm. um, I don't think that the dialogue was as good. I don't think the characters were as engaging as you were saying. We don't really, really know a whole lot about the backstory. Like... You know, in Big Lebowski, <clears throat> you've got Walter, and <clears throat> you know so much about his backstory just from the little things he peppers his conversations with. Um, you know, his his uh, conversion to Judaism, uh, you know, his service in Vietnam, uh, the fact his that failed he... failed marriage. His failed marriage, the fact that he dabbled in pa pacifism, not in Nam, of course. Um, <laughs> I just don't think I don't think this one is is going to stand the test of time like like Lebowski did, and I understand why you're asking if you like the Big Lebowski the first time. I, I've heard a lot of people don't because they're watching for the plot, which is so convoluted and ultimately irrelevant. It's not the point, <laughs> it's not the point of the movie. Um, but I think when you're making a movie about the Sharon Tate murders, you'd better have a strong plot, and this one kind of meandered a bit. So that's why I think the difference is between Lebowski and this one. So one thing I think that exists always with a story that makes it good is the agency of a hero in that story. Oh, yeah. And I think where the Big Lebowski is interesting is he has no agency, but by choice. He just, I'm a go with the flow, man. Like, he's willing to be bounced around in these areas. So you don't feel bad for him because he's not like this guy who's pathetic mm -hmm. and he's just being told where to go. He just doesn't care. And so he just wanders where, and that's what makes him cool. That's what makes him the dude. Right. But in this story, it feels like, they don't have agency, but it's because they're sad and pathetic and being bounced around. Yeah. The thing about Lebowski is that, yeah, he, he chooses to just go with the flow, but then he's got these moments of sheer panic, and they don't they don't really change his underlying character at all. It's like it's like wait, you're gonna fucking gun around, but it doesn't it doesn't ultimately affect who he is. <laughs> he's right? too he's, cool, man. He's too he's, cool for that. He's way too cool for that. Yeah. So Juan, it's 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 time, man. You got to give this film a grade. <laughs> 
It's such a fucking cop out to call it a C, but <laughs> I, I like I wait, literally wait. I li- I really want to just like either. Well, are you agreeing with me? <laughs> I mean, Someone you teach Chicago public sure school kids, so you yeah, have to know how to grade. Uh, look, no, like, until until I watch it, like, at least, like, again, like I said, I'm the person who I still don't know how I feel about Hateful Eight, so I'm going to say a C, but I'll say that um, this definitely even is, like, it has to be at the bottom of my... Okay, so you're, you're at a it's a, it's a It's below Hateful Eight, even yeah, for okay. me, right? I, <laughs> Fuck! All right. You're <laughs> at like, a C right now. I'm at a C right now. It could either it could either go lower, honestly, yeah. or it could it, it can end up at a B. It's not going to end up ever end up at A. But here's here's the question: You're at a C now. On a scale of one to ten, how much do you want to rewatch this movie? Seven. Okay. Yeah. All right. So it could go it could go a little bit higher. I mean, I definitely. I mean, like that's it's Tarantino. <laughs> you know what I mean? It's like. It's a cultural event, but like, well, I just have to talk about like what you said though about like agency and everything like that. That I think that was one interesting thing that like I never I didn't think about. Like Rick Dalton is not a pathetic like character at all. Like he that all his failure and his bullshit. He's literally living in the Hollywood Hills, like doing just fine. They show Brad Pitt going back to a hovel, right, and being totally like cool about he's like where his awesome. life is, and yeah. even when he's like. Yep, all right. I'm not going to have a job anymore. That's cool, man. I'll drive you around. Mm-hmm. Like, oh, I can't do that. Yeah, like, do that or whatever. Like, I was expecting him to be like, oh, like, he's a psycho. Like, really? And he's going to be like, I've done all this shit for you. Mm-hmm. And now, like, I'm getting cut off. But it's like, like, that was one thing that I thought was really interesting. It's like, I didn't even think about it. It's like, the kind of, like, mentality that he had. He's like, oh, I'm a fucking failure. It's like, mm-hmm. it's like, dude, you're doing okay, man. Like, but I think he's also pathetic where he's in a level where, like, one guy comes into his life, one critic or agent or whatever, Al Pacino's character, comes in and says, like, yeah, you're going to be. He's like, I'm washed up. I'm awful. And, yeah. like, Brad Pitt's like, why are you freaking out, man? Yeah. <laughs> goes so, to, he goes to Italy, makes a bunch of money, and comes back with a beautiful Italian wife. And he's still like, what am I going to do? <laughs> yeah, I don't know. Like, okay. <laughs> like, don't cry in front of the Mexicans. <laughs> <laughs> I said this movie didn't have any quotable lines, and here I am quoting there the lines. There you go. Damn it. See? Uh, okay. So you gotta watch it, man. You gotta do it again. Okay. Uh, any final thoughts? I'd say that um, this movie, to me, it seems like Tarantino has become a too Tarantino for Tarantino's own good. That's a good way to put it to me. But this didn't feel like a Tarantino movie to me. That's the biggest problem that I had with it. It didn't feel... It felt too much like a Tarantino movie. I didn't feel the style, you know? I didn't feel the quick wit. I didn't feel the dialogue that made me want to listen to these characters more. And that was I'd say it's more like Tarantino was... since Inglorious Bastards. Like, this is like the continuation of a train that he's been going on. Yeah. And it's just going a stop or two past where it should have. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> okay. All right. All right, so that kind of wraps up our discussion about Once Upon a Time in Hollywood, a weaker Tarantino movie, um, but still a Tarantino movie. If you're a completist, you'll you'll watch it. (laughs) Um, All right, so uh, thanks, Steve, Juan, Joe, Aaron, Jordan, and Eve, and uh, Shirley, and Max, and I'm not going to say your name right. What is it again? Finin. 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 Juan's Juan's little brother, Finin, is here also. Uh, thanks very much for watching, and we'll see you in about a month. Hey, DJ, thanks for having us. Margot Robbie was fucking useless. Fucking, you fucking, you fucking, you fucking, 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 fucking,